Guy Chambers is a multi-award winning songwriter and producer who's worked with artists including Rufus Wainwright and Kylie Minogue, though he's perhaps best known for writing with British singer Robbie Williams. We talked to Guy and engineer and producer Richard Flack about working in the beautifully equipped Sleeper Sounds studio in London. First, we asked them what they aimed to achieve when they were designing the studio. Well, my aim was to have somewhere to write, because that's what I mainly do here. So I wanted somewhere inspiring, um, creative, somewhere where I could easily get to all of the instruments uh, and without any... I hate waiting, I mean, as Richard will confirm, I'm very impatient. So when I'm in the mood to do something, I don't want to do it straight away, I don't want to wait. So all the keyboards are on and, and I wanted somewhere with lots of light because um, the studio I was before was quite dark and I wanted somewhere near my house or something I could easily commute to. Um, but in terms of the look of it, Richard designed the studio basically, didn't you Richard? It was finding a space to put all of Guy's stuff in it. He's got a lot of stuff. He likes to, doesn't like spending around, spending a lot of time sodding around with virtual instruments. He likes to go to something and play it, and he's got lots of things to play. It was a case of um, ergonomically designing the room so everything was easily accessible and technically designing the room so that everything was plugged in, mic'd up through a signal chain that would work with whatever instrument it was. So you just open up a track in Pro Tools and bang, you can go. So it's, it's the, uh, the idea was to make it as, as quick as possible as Guy is not known for his patience. Sleeper Sounds has some rather striking acoustic features. We asked what the rationale was for using these less conventional designs and what effect they have on the sound of the room. Well, the mushrooms were Guy's suggestion, ripped off the um, Royal Albert Hall. I'm not sure how much of an impact they have <laughs> at, the, at the Royal Albert Hall, but they look good. Um, they're basically diffusers right above you and then above them their um, absorption so that anything goes up doesn't come down again or this comes down and gets scattered around and the, the books are as well as aesthetically pleasing very good absorbers I mean you know you just diffuse as much as you can and absorb the right kind of frequencies I mean it's not um, not anywhere near um, dead um, you're definitely aware of all the space around you but the um, it's done a pretty good job, I think. Yeah. I enjoy listening to music in here. I do like dead spaces, but for me, I wanted, I didn't want it to, to, well, to make this room completely dead would be very difficult, wouldn't it? Yeah. A lot of, a lot of studios, they're very, very dead and dark sounding. Um, a lot of the old style, you know, mix rooms of the 80s and 90s, they're very dead. And a lot of people have gone away from that. And I mean, me personally, I quite like to hear the environment that I'm in. And you can, uh, if you work in a space for any length of time, you get used to that environment and you've got a definite idea of your position within it. And, and so it doesn't become a problem. And how important then is the surrounding to the creative process? Well, I think you can write anywhere. And I have written any, in all sorts of, you know, back of tour buses on a, uh, on a plane, uh, various holiday homes, all sorts of places. But um, having said that, um, there is, I'm always happy to come into this space. I get a buzz from it every day. We asked about the beautiful EMI desk that lives in Sleeper Sounds. Why did Guy choose it? It didn't, it, I didn't really choose it, it kind of chose me um, in that it's, it's from Abbey Road and uh, my also it was a portable desk it's got wheels it used to be taken around the country in different churches and halls and and various orchestras were recorded through that desk and my dad used to play in the london philharmonic orchestra and almost certainly recorded through that desk so i had a bit of a sentimental uh, it wasn't just the abbey road connection it was also my dad as well because my dad was a flute player and uh, but I do, I mean, aesthetically, I do find it very pleasing to look at. And it sounds amazing too, so when you get both those things, it's great. 
What is the writing and recording process with an artist like Robbie Williams, for example? Um, he gets quite a buzz from a track already in progress. He likes a certain amount of music to... So what we tend to do, if he walks through the room, we immediately give him a mic, a handheld mic, and he immediately starts singing, if he likes the track, over it. And we record everything he does, because sometimes his first thoughts are really very strong. And, um, and I'm sort of playing along at the same time, trying to interact with him. I like, I like jamming with people when I'm writing. I like, uh, I like, playing, I like playing at the same time. I like getting involved, you know, mm -hmm. and not just watching it. I like sort of, I suppose, directing it in a way. Um, that's what it's like with Rob. Yeah, you just have to record everything because he, he'll, sometimes he'll never sing anything again. Or he'll only sing it once, rather. I, I can't I miss having a DAP machine in a studio <laughs> where you just have the output of the desk constantly recorded and, and everything gets, you know, you never, never miss any idea. You can do the same thing on your phone now, I guess, but it's not quite so good quality but um thing. yeah they just have to make sure you've got a session open where there's lots of things available to record and make it quick not not worry too much about the if it's being over compressed or you know if it's uh, the technicalities of it as far as the initial writing process is concerned it's just capturing it capturing the moment is the most important we asked where Guy starts when writing a song and how to spot when you've struck on something really good. It's, a, it's an experimentation. It's, 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 you just sort of wander around in the dark and hope that you <laughs> wander on some, something good, you know. Um, I think there's an energy in the room when music is working. Um, you know, you sort of, the energy level gets quite high. You everyone gets more interested. <laughs> that's good. Oh, let's do that. Let's, you know, and then yeah. the music sort of pulls you along and dictates where, it, where it, you know, rather than you try and. You want to finish it. You want to put more stuff on it. Hopefully, the lyricist wants to fill all the, you know, do all the verses. Well, fill, finish the lyric. Because I'm a big believer in finishing things. I don't like things being unfinished. And um, it's sort of the energy of the the music drags you along to the to the end. When you're working something that's not great, that doesn't tend to happen. It just sort of the energy just sort of goes fizzles and just sort of, um, you know. And I think that's how you know when something's good. But in terms of it being commercial, that's a whole other thing, and that's to do with where the artist is in her or his career, and um, how hot they are, and how you know how much radio likes them, and the management and timing and all those things, and. As a songwriter, I try not to get too involved in the politics of, and the, the show business side of things, because it, it just wears you out. What about creative block? Do Guy or Richard have any tips for getting over it? Hangover, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes um, un unblocks your creativity. Big believer in hangovers. <clears throat> Good, good, good night out on the tiles the night before, and um, next day something usually happens pretty good. That's not a, not a <laughs> advocating <laughs> binge drinking or anything. No, but I am a big believer in <clears throat> on, in doing stuff. You know, going out, meeting people, having fun, talking to people is. You've got to get inspiration from somewhere, you know, and I. I think hiding away in your studio all, and working 16 hour days isn't necessarily a great way of being a writer. I, th I do think you need to get out and live a life as well. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, we all have our good days and bad days. Some day, sometimes, you know, I am a bit of a loss what to do, but that, isn't that, I, I would imagine most people are, aren't they? I don't know. I'm, I'm very critical as well, you know, if, <clears throat> if something's boring me if I'm boring myself you know, I kind of think well am I, if that's if I'm boring myself I'm probably going to be boring other people so I try and shut that down with there being so many real and virtual instruments available to songwriters and producers today how does Guy know where to start I tend to have certain instruments that 
given me a lot of help, like that piano over there, the Steinway, is to play it is such a deep experience and the overtones of it and the physicality of it, just being in front of it, but playing, playing it. And it's a loud instrument and it sort of takes you over physically, you can feel it in your body. Um, so I'm lucky enough to have that. I didn't always have that. I mean, there was a time when I, I didn't own a piano. I was still recording, you know, but um, in my bedroom. Uh, but um, so I go to that piano and certain guitars have that as well. They, they just, great instruments, you start playing them and they, you write something on them immediately, I find. That's how I, that's how I buy a new guitar or anything, a keyboard. If I'm not writing on it immediately, I won't buy it. Well, I'm currently loving that Prophet 6, and that's my new favourite instrument. Uh, we only bought it a couple of weeks ago, but I'm loving that thing. It's incredible. I'm having a bit of a love affair at the moment, so I chuck it on everything <laughs> at the moment. The, the Moog's always a good favourite. The Mini so. Moog is, for bass, unbelievable, and that's a really old one. Um, the, the, the Rhodes, the Wurlitz, uh the clarinet, the organ, the hammered organ. I think um, great instruments <clears throat> hopefully make you play things that you wouldn't normally play. You know, when I plugged that Prophet 6 in, I, it did some random thing with the sequencer when we first started playing it. That, um, we immediately, I, Richard immediately recorded it, fortunately, because um, he records everything. I like, because I like random things happening. I like accidents as well. Um, and uh, that became, became a song, this sequence. Uh, I didn't even know what sound it was or what, what the chords were, because it had all sorts of overtones. And I like things like that, because I want to be surprised by music, you know. I, I don't like the typical cookie-cutter chords that everybody uses at the moment. And that's not to say I haven't used them, I have, but I'm trying to avoid using them if I can, because I don't want all songs to sound the same, you know. I think my best songs do avoid those cliches. They might have other cliches <laughs> in them, but I do think they avoid the, what's the, you know, C, G, A minor, F, or all the, the, the certain sequences that so many songs seem to be in, people just pick the same chords. I don't even really understand it, other than is it just a kind of laziness? I don't know what it is. Guy has amassed an incredible array of classic gear, but what is it about vintage recording equipment that he's so drawn to? Well, I have been around studio, studios a long time, and you know, certain bits of old gear like the Fairchild, which is down there, um, I, it's, it's not just a sentimental attack, att attachment to something from another era. I mean, it's a very old piece of gear, but it does have a very distinctive quality, sound quality to it. And I also believe that every time you put something through it, it sounds different. And that's, what, that's the difference between something like that and a bit of software, which will be entirely consistent. Mm -hmm. um, everything, nearly everything in this room that's old is inconsistent. I don't want things to be completely blandly the same every time you... That's why I like old gear. We asked how Guy and Richard approached their roles in the studio and how the creative partnership works. I mean, I'm a producer, but I'm not an engineer producer. I, I don't, I'm, I'm not interested in miking up someone or, or uh, fiddling with sound. I'm just completely disinterested in that. There was a time when I was younger when I was sort of interested in it, but when the technology became so much more advanced, I, it kind of left me behind. I'm quite happy just to think about the songs, the lyrics, the melody, and then let Richard or whoever else I'm working with to concentrate on actually put, putting it down and organising it. Because of all the technology has come on so much, it's much easier for someone like me who doesn't play an instrument to express themselves creatively without actually having to, that sounds terrible, but spend put in the hours learning to play something but you know obviously this you know I, 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 um, I don't profess to, profess to being a, uh, a musician 
but um, I've got a pretty good idea of what sounds what sounds good just from a punter's perspective, if you like, and you know, having a love for music and when something isn't right. But with technology now, before it was very difficult to do that, but now it's much easier to to um, express yourselves creatively with, you know, how you manipulate something, um, even if it's just editing other people's performances. <laughs> you know, he knows what what drums feel. He's really, really good at drums, and you know, a drummer does a performance, and then he finds the best bits of that performance, which is what Quincy Jones famously did with Michael Jackson's recordings, you know, he would record 15 minutes of the drums playing and then he would find the best bars and loop them. So it's been going on a long time, but Richard's particularly good at the detail of that stuff. We asked Richard how he records drums and if there's anything unusual about his go-to mic setup. Well, there's quite a few mics on them. Um, isn't, we don't always go to a live um, you know live drums if we're work, working with a band or working with session musicians then, then yeah then, then the drums but the drums are always set up so if anyone walks in they can literally just jump on the kit and start playing and you know open up a pro tool session and start recording and so there's a pretty standard setting setup of you know nothing out of the ordinary um, and then there's a couple of other mics that are you know mono overhead mic you know or to get and um, one up inside, pointing across the beta, so it, so it almost you know at pointing at the underneath of the, the snare. So the the kick drum is effectively side chaining the the snares. So you get like a so there's lots of and there's other you know little mics in there which don't always get used, but you know they're all available. So you can record everything and then and then decide how you want to manipulate it afterwards, and then usually smash decapitator over most things and it sounds great. <laughs> What about other standard recording chains? How does Richard approach recording other instruments in the studio? Well, the piano um, has, no, I mean, the way I like to record it normally, it's got the um, M49 um, uh, on there, which is, you know, very lucky that Guy's got a pair of M49s, um, which sounds great. And they usually go through the EMI, which sounds great. And um, if you want to, Commit your compression to tape, which we norm sorry to to tape yeah to tape. Then, <laughs> then you um, the EMI compressors sound awesome on the piano. Uh, um, they sound they sound good on a lot of things. They're not so they're very harsh and attacky, and you can hear it working. And um, but um, they're a bit noisy. But um, if you prepare if you prepare to put up with the noise, they sound awesome. Um, drums. Most of the uh, most of the drum mics go through the EMI also, and then a couple of other things go through certain different things. So we do change it around though. Most things are most recording chains are usually set up, but sometimes um, it's it's very easy to become not say lazy, but if you know something works, is to leave it like that. And sometimes you have to almost force yourself to change it, but at least you're working from a position to change it and if and you know if everything's set up with the mics you know you can change the drum it's it's just as easy to change the snare drum or change the kick drum or change the overheads rather than change the mic preamps that are recording them and you get a much bigger difference with changing the drums than you do with changing the mic preamp as well as playing piano guy also plays guitar and has an impressive selection of amps yeah, I love playing guitar, I love making a lot of noise. I, go, I, I collect amps, um, collect guitars. I don't really like Amp Farm very much. Yeah, I like real amps. Again, because they, every time you switch a valve amp on, they sound different and you can fiddle with it. Easy. Well, I, I just like, I don't like the noise. I just, I like feeling the physicality of noise. When looking for inspiration, which other artists or songwriters do they turn to? I listen to a lot of music, uh, even though I find the fact that music is everywhere when you go these days really annoying, you know, in a hairdressers or a supermarket or anywhere there's pop music and it's been devalued massively, but despite all that, there's people making incredible music, you know, and you've just got to have the patience to, to hunt it down. But I, I mean, I, I, I find going to the ballet inspiring, you know, um, I like a lot of classical music, so 
I plunder a lot of that for se chord sequences and bass lines, and I get it from classical music. I don't just look think about pop music. Mm. I think the answer the answer is to keep your mind open to all different types of music and not just chart music. It's very important to keep listening to music and not just what you're working on. It's very, mm. It'd be very easy to, it's, you know, when you listen to music all day, just to. Last thing I want to do is listen to music, but you have to almost force yourself to, you know, to rediscover, rediscover other people's music rather than just what you've been listening to all day. Yeah, when I'm working with an artist, I, I nearly always ask them what's it, what's what are they most excited about, and I will listen, will spend a bit of time listening to what they're getting excited about, just so I'm on trying to tune in on their wavelength, you know, rather than thinking they need to tune in on my wavelength. It's very important. It's a reciprocal thing, writing. You've got to share. You know, you've, you've, it's, it's a sharing process. It's not, you're, you're not in necessarily in charge, although sometimes it's nice to be in charge, but um, it's good if you, when, you, when it's a sharing thing. We won't necessarily listen to, I know some people when they start a writing session, they will listen to what's currently number one on iTunes, and that's their starting point, and, but that's fine. I think for us, we listen to songs that we think remind us of what we're working on, and then you and, and a sort of a template to see is our song moving as well as this song? You know, say it's a song. It could be anybody. Say Casey, Casey and the Sunshine Band, for example. They're amazing. Those songs are amazing. The way they're well, everything about them is amazing. But the way they move is particularly amazing. So, if we're working on a song that we're trying to get people to move to, you, it's good to compare your groove to ones that definitely make people move and you know, you've seen them at weddings or whatever. Um, so we do stuff like that. We compare our groove to other people's groove, don't we? Sometimes yeah. much more much more technical than that as well and to, and to the point of why I, I've, I've taken the track into Pro Tools and worked out how far the bass is behind the kick drum and what other elements are and analysed why that groove sounds great and ripped it off. <laughs> <laughs> With, ripped off the groove as opposed to the, you know, the other, uh, you know, not what the instrumentation is, but yeah, and um, to varying degrees, but yeah, a couple of successful attempts. Finally, what advice does Guy have for songwriters and what advice does Richard have for those getting into engineering and production? Become a songwriter. <laughs> <laughs> That's not very helpful. No. <laughs> um, I think uh, as, uh, as I come across a lot recently that the artist is also the songwriter, is also the producer, the engineer and the mixer. If you only want to do one thing, I think you're, um, I think you're, you're limiting yourself somewhat. You should op open up your, open, open yourself up to doing everything. And, you know, you have to call in help of um, if you can't quite manage it, but you should have a go. Work out whether you're the artist would be the first thing, and if the answer is yes, then you need to get out there and perform your songs and see how people react to it. And when I say get out there, that can be YouTube, but I also think going to a pub and performing is just as valid as that and see how people physically react to your songs. You know, do they, are they staring at you? If they're not staring at you, you probably aren't the artist. And if you're not the artist, you need to find somebody who is an artist that people want to listen to, smile at and stare back at. It's as simple as that. If you enjoyed this video, subscribe to the Sound on Sound YouTube channel or subscribe to the magazine available in print, on our website or on tablet. Thanks for watching. <laughs>